But let's be realistic. Jesus is not an easy man to follow. If he was, the disciples wouldn't have all scattered after the Garden of Gethsemane. They were afraid. So afraid that even stalwart Peter denied Christ three times when he saw the shadow of the cross start to creep up, creep up behind him. He wanted nothing to do with that. You. You, yeah, you. You hung out with that Jesus guy that I got in there, right? That was you. Who? Me? No, never seen him. Funny, I could have swore I saw you with him before. You must be mistaken. I have that kind of face. Get it all the time. People are constantly thinking I'm the grandson. It, it must be you. You are one of his disciples. I swear I'm not. Never seen the man. And the rooster crows. Christ himself was afraid. Because he knew what taking up the cross meant. He was so afraid that he stayed up all night praying about it. Have you ever stayed up all night praying because of something you knew you must do, but you really didn't want to do, that you knew was coming with the rising of the sun the next morning? And so you just sat there in bed, nervous, shaking, sweating. Christ was so upset. It says he sweated blood. Christ knew what it would cost him if he took up that cross. But he also knew what it would cost the world if he didn't. So he said, not my will, but your will, Father. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Give your life away. Give away your heart and your soul, your energy, your strength, your love and compassion. Give it to all those who need it. Because you see, the authenticity of any church is measured not in what it does for itself, but what it does for others. It's the nature of the church to give its life to those who need it. It doesn't take in wealth to keep it, but to give it. Its life is preserved through giving. The one who seeks to save his life will lose it, but he who loses himself for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. The church must pour out its strength among the weak, its wealth among the poor, its gospel among the estranged, its joy among the sad, for to keep it is to lose it, to share it, is to renew it. Jesus took up his cross the day he started preaching and bore it through Galilee to Jerusalem on his bare back through the streets of Jerusalem from the judgment hall of Pilate to a hill outside the city called Golgotha. And while on the way to Calvary, he slumped under the weight of the cross. Who will take up the cross? The Roman soldiers began searching through the crowds, trying to find someone, but no one stepped forward and said, I'll take it. It's kind of like at the committee meeting when they ask, who will chair this committee? And everyone looks down and kind of steps back, trying to hide behind the other people. That's what everyone in the crowd was doing. The Roman soldiers were trying to find someone, and everyone just kind of made themselves look small and feeble. I mean, no one wanted to carry it. The Jewish people wouldn't carry it because they were too scared. The disciples wouldn't carry it because they weren't even there. And the Romans wouldn't carry it because, frankly, they didn't care. Until the soldiers gaze fell upon the face of a young man named Simon from Cyrene. Him they compelled to bear the cross. They made him do it. They drove him to do it. At first he resented it. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to bear this cross for this stranger, but then he looked over next to him at the face of his strange partner and saw cosmic victory written in his brow. He saw love and power and pity and mercy mingled all together in the face of Jesus. Instantly, he accepted the cross. He, didn't, he knew he wasn't just compelled to carry it, but called to carry it. And Simon didn't ask, what will happen to me if I do bear it, but what will happen to the world if I don't bear it? We decided to carry the tank. We had to. But none of us could carry it alone. I still have a picture of Conrad and I struggling up this mountain with these big, bulky backpacks, each one hand on this tank lugging it up. We started calling Conrad Tank after that weekend, a nickname that still sticks today. You know, I thought I couldn't. I thought we couldn't. I thought it would end in ruin, but we did manage to get that thing up and down the mountain. And it made all the difference. I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that I wouldn't be standing up here preaching had it not been for that weekend, had it not been for getting that tank up and down that mountain. That weekend was really a turning point in my life, everything that happened. 
Life is like that a lot of times. The things that are really important carry a heavy burden. Glory, the word glory really means a weight. Anything glorious is going to weigh you down. It's not going to be easy. A weight. But that was one of the most amazing weekends. And it's because we did carry the tank. It wouldn't have been the same if we hadn't picked it up and borne it. So what's your decision today? Will we here, each of us today, just lead another life of self-interest, self-preservation, selfish autonomy? Or will we hear the call of Christ to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him? There's very practical ways this can happen. I'm not going to tell you how that works itself out in your life. There's a food pantry in town. Who's going to work it and who's going to stock it? There's a grieving widow in the world. Who's going to comfort her? There's a teenager disillusioned with everything. Who will inspire him? There's a woman with a sick daughter who's desperate for help. Who will make sure she gets healed? Who will give up a little bit of what they have, a little bit of the comfort and security they have so another just has a chance? Who will take it? There's a man with scars on his hands and on his feet and a hole in his side with a commission. Who will take it? Who will bear a cross? Will the church? Will you? We do have backs to bear, after all. I want to end with a parable. A parable from a Danish Christian existential philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard. That's a big title, Christian Danish existential philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. But he's awesome. He has all these parables. And the one he tells, one of my favorites, about a, about a church of ducks. And there's a pastor of this church of ducks. I don't know if he's a duck or not, but let's pretend the pastor's a duck as well. He's got his little robe on, and it comes down to his little webbed feet. And he's up there in the pulpit, and he's preaching a powerful message. Sunday after Sunday, we are ducks. We have wings. We can fly. You are ducks. You have wings. You can fly. And the ducks are all nodding their heads like they get in a hunt. That is true. We are ducks. We do have wings. We can fly. It's the message they want to hear. It's a powerful service. After the service, the duck pastor gets off the podium, and he waddles down the aisle, maybe shakes wings with a few people along the way. He gets out by the door, and all the ducks are filing past, shaking wings, saying, that was a great sermon, Reverend Duck. That was a great sermon. We We are ducks. We have wings. We can fly. And they waddle on out as they walk home. We are children of God, followers of Christ. We have backs. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us the strength and the courage to follow you. Direct our lives. Direct us in the ways that we can bear the cross of Christ, continuing his work in the world, not in the same way, but in similar ways feeding, giving hope, taking care of, breaking down boundaries, telling of your love and good news. Give us the strength and the courage, Lord, to say, I will take it. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.